Well, welcome. As you know, I am your host, Cindy, and today we're going to be talking with Hesha Abrams about how to hold the calm as the key to success in negotiations. Welcome, Hesha. It's so great to have you here. It's my pleasure. Thank you. And for those of you who don't know Hesha, she's an internationally acclaimed master attorney and mediator known for crafting really highly creative settlements and resolutions in really difficult matters. So you can see why I just had to get her on here to talk to you about the art of negotiation and this concept or model about holding the calm. So why don't you tell us first, Hesha, how'd you come to do this line of work? Well, interestingly, I've been doing it over three decades. And, you know, back in the day, you had a kid, it was very hard to manage having a child and doing high quality, difficult work. And it was very challenging. And one day I met this woman who was a mediator in like divorce kind of cases. And I just said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You meet with people, yeah. you talk to them and solve problems for a living. <laughs> this is <so> great. <laughs> and back in the day, there wasn't very much. So you literally was the Wild West. You couldn't invent things. So, yeah. I mean, I've done every kind of case you can possibly imagine from multi-billion dollar, huge international trade deals yeah. and pharmaceutical and high big tech things where that are dominating, world dominating of a market, all the way down to someone being killed or, you know, Dow chemical kind of things or breast implant cases or yeah. asbestos. It's all just human beings. And yeah. we're all in a way in a big negotiation playing bumper car egos. Yes. And so the more you understand that, the more you know how to maneuver in there successfully so that you can prevail, which is, you know, really, we all say, oh, win, win. We should all be nice and all this. And it's like, yeah, right. <laughs> Everybody wants to win. So the question <laughs> is, how can you win? Sometimes you got to let the other guy win a little too, but yeah. how, and sometimes you don't, sometimes you just got to close the door and have a boundary. It all depends on what you're dealing with. Yeah. Well, and I love that you spoke to this idea as well, because you don't hear people talk to that often that it doesn't matter how small or how big, how much gravitas there is to the issue. The principles are the same, right? I mean, all of exactly. life is negotiation, whether you're negotiating with your kids or whether you're negotiating those multi-billion dollar deals. So I, I love that you spoke to that elephant in the room, as they say. Now, I know your signature I model for negotiating is holding the calm and you've got your book out by that same name. So tell us a bit about that. Thank you. So, you know, I've been doing this 30 years and I know what actually works. Yeah. And so, every, and I've made a lot of speeches and people are always saying, you got to write a book. You got to write a book. Who had time to write a book? Like I was working, I was busy. Yeah. I, you know, there wasn't any time. And I had a hysterectomy in 2020 and I was grounded for six weeks yeah. and knock on wood, it all turned out fine, but I was grounded. And I thought, okay, I'm going to write my book. And it literally poured out of me. Wow. And I tried to make it not theory because most books out there and most classes are yeah. get a PhD in this or take a master class in that or get yeah. a certificate in this. Who has time for that? <laughs> I got to deal with the jerk next door. I got to deal with a bad boss. I got to deal with a trade union union guy that's impossible. I got to deal with a bad manager. You know, I, have to, I need something right now. What can I do? Yeah. And it was like a challenge of how do I distill things down to professionals where, yes, please do this at home. <laughs> you know? do it. So that's literally what I did. And it was, and when I wrote it, I'll tell you, I, I didn't know it was any good. I mean, I'm honest enough with myself yeah. to say, how do we know? I don't want my ego involved. So I sent it to a bunch of people and I said, writing a book is so much work, getting it published, getting it out. There's so much work. Yeah. If it's not really good and it doesn't really help people, I don't want to do it, yeah. you know? And I got what the comments I got back were, can I give it? Do you mind if I give your PDF to my brother-in-law? He's having trouble with his boss. Nice. Do you mind if I give your PDF here and here? And I went, okay. Yeah. All right. I'm on to something. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So tell us a bit, let's sort of unpack, like holding the calm. What is the model? I, I mean, I've got a sense of what I expect, but I'd love to hear you share with our listeners about what is the theory behind holding the calm as the model to follow. So I am very, very practical. I only care about is what really works, not what should work, not yeah. what you want to work, but what actually does work with human beings. Yeah. And so, you know, in, I will tell you this, in every single negotiation, it's a precursor to every single conflict. Yeah. And in every single one, the DNA underlying all of it is powerlessness. Yeah. Everybody wants power. So they grab power however they can, sometimes artfully, usually inartfully. And then that's what leads to conflict or really tough, difficult negotiations 
because you may say win-win, but it's not win. It's I. It, it's all still distributed bargaining. I want to win more than you. And so how do you change that story and how to do it? So when there's tension and there's difficulty, actually the worst thing you can say to somebody is calm down. You know, never in the history of calming down has anyone ever calmed down by being told to calm down. And there's actually a neuroscience reason for that. There's an amygdala in our brains that probably most of your listeners know about it. It's the fear and negativity center in our brain. And it's just above the reptilian brain. So it's really primitive and doesn't take time to think or to use the prefrontal cortex, which is behind the forehead. It just reacts instantly and instantaneously. And it does that always when there's a feeling of being threatened. Yeah. So either you rage, you get angry, you withdraw, you're passive aggressive, you're manipulative, you get allies, you get weapons. That's just completely natural. You don't tell people not to do it because it does it. So in order to hold the calm, the first thing you have to do is get a hold of yourself when your amygdala is triggered. Yeah. So rather than say, oh, take a deep breath, which is good, it's okay. Yeah. But what it says to your amygdala is, ooh, God, you're out of control. You better get some oxygen in there, which actually makes the amygdala a little more triggered. But if you say power things like, okay, I am holding the calm. I am holding the calm. I'm holding the calm. It's like a talisman or a mantra or a rabbit's foot. Yeah. Now you have power. Now I have, I, I've got choices. Yeah. What do I choose to do? How do I choose to handle this in this situation? Yeah. It drains 50% of that toxic swamp out immediately. And that's sort of the basis of how we start this now. Okay. How, how, what do we do? How do we handle it in this situation? How do we handle it in that? Yeah. I love that idea, actually, that t taking back the power rather than just being in a passive kind of breathing mode to get yourself grounded, you breathe by all means, but have that sort of talisman, as you say, to empower yourself. And I was laughing internally. I had two things you've said so far that gave, made me uh, chuckle here. I mean, one, you said that, you know, those unions, because I practiced trade union labor law for 30 years. So I, I totally hear you on that. So funny. But the only time I think I have ever called into a radio show for one of those, when they say, who has the answer? answer to this. The question was, what's something that you can say to a woman that will prompt the exact opposite response of what you've asked for? And I was in, I knew immediately, I'm like, oh my gosh, it is calm down, right? Or relax. Isn't it, relax. Isn't it ridiculous? Um, yes. And if so, you think about it, it's so disrespectful because let me, can I give your viewers a visual? That's an interesting story that people will like. Doctors deal with pus and feces and urine and all kinds of gross stuff, but they need that to diagnose what's wrong. Yeah. So those of us that are in negotiation or conflict resolution, or even just regular life dealing yeah. with conflict, what are the big emotions? Well, it's the pus, the feces, the urine, the junk, but it's stubbornness, self-righteousness, arrogance, anger, fear, yeah. withdrawal, manipulation. Yeah. It's the same thing. And so what happens is if you go into an emergency room and you go, oh, I don't feel good, Blah, and you vomit, <laughs> all of us go, oh, gross, I'm going to back away, but not the ER doc. Yeah. The ER doc looks at it. What's yeah. in there? Is there? Does it smell the right way? Yeah. Is there other pills in there? Is there metal in there? I mean, it's a diagnostic. I give that to everybody listening that when people have big emotions of any, and, and withdrawal and stubbornness are also big emotions. Yeah. Any of the thing where your, your amygdala says, oh, oh calm down lean forward into it and it's diagnostic. You yeah. can learn so much and either you build a bridge, which is always tremendous in negotiation. I mean, have all your listeners, they listen to you. They know that kind of stuff. You build a bridge, you stop a barrier. You can completely change where the other guy thought they were playing hard tackle American football and you went, yeah, let's play golf. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're in charge of the ball and how you want to change it yeah. just by how you change the dynamic and how you handle the intensity of those emotions. Oh my gosh, that emergency room analogy is so good. And I thank you for the warning that we had a graphic visual coming. That was so perfect. And I love that. And I want to really put a pin in that for our listeners as well. That idea about have that mindset shift that instead of pushing back when you see those things, get curious, lean in. Like mm -hmm. curiosity is one of my favorite words in negotiation. Start asking questions, lean in, try and uncover, bring that empathy to the table to figure what's really underlying this, right? Where's this fear coming from? Where's this anger coming from? Where's this emotion coming from? So yeah. powerful. And yeah. speaking of that power, well, taking power back, I'd love if you could speak to this idea about power over versus power with. I think 
Our North yeah. American society in particular is so conditioned to see success based on that very competitive model, as you say, that yes. distributive model. And we always come seeking to exert power over. I'd love your thoughts on that. That's an excellent question, by the way. And it's what we were just talking about. Let's say someone has these really big and huge emotions and you don't run away or attack back, which is really the two options. You either yeah. run away or you attack back. Cool. You don't do either of those things and you lean forward into that person. You are developing rapport, my friend. Yes. That's what's actually happening because it's unexpected and they don't believe that it should happen. Now you're not afraid. You're credible. You can stand your ground. That's the whole power with, there's no need to power over. When someone tries to overpower me in a negotiation, which happens all the time. I mean, I deal with very intense type A personalities all the time and they'll always try to overpower me. And the funny thing is when they can't do it, I literally earn the respect. Yeah. So if you just pull back and you don't fight back because we're not going to play hard tackle American football, we're going to play tennis because I'm better at tennis. Yeah. That's how we're going to do that one, right? <laughs> and and when if they're doing something, it depends on what they're doing. Sometimes I may use, and in the book, I give tons of sentence stems. And what I suggest to people is memorize them yeah. so that you have them, you know, if you had the right thing to say at the right time, every time, you know, you'd be, you'd be golden. So memorize these sentence stems so they're in your head. So you can say to somebody, oh, how's that working out for you? Yeah. Or did you intend to offend me with that? Yeah. Or what outcome would you like to provoke with that kind of a statement or that kind of approach? Yeah. How did you think I would react? You know, those kinds of things show who's in power. Now, all of a sudden, the person that is trying to overpower literally has to crawl back because you have just shown them who has the real power. Yeah. And I have to tell you, it's not hard. And the first few times you do it, you might get a little shaky and nervous, especially if he's someone, he or she, someone very aggressive. Yeah. And the trick I say to people, one, you do the mantra, I'm holding the calm, <laughs> and you root your feet into the ground, yeah. like you root. So whatever works for you, you're a tree, you're in a river, down to the center of the earth, whatever works for you, you root yourself. Yeah. And now you've got these four or five sentence stems just right at the handy. And you say something out, you may have to do it twice to stop the onslaught. They're literally going to look at you shocked. Like, what does somebody say if I say, did you intend to offend me? Yeah. 95% of the time, they're going to backpedal, backpedal, backpedal. <laughs> but let's, let's, let's do the advanced class here. Let's say they say, yes, I did. I intended to offend you. I find you a blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, at least we know where we stand now. Yeah. Why, why is it that it's so offensive to you? Yes. Why are you feeling so threatened by it? Yeah. Now, again, who's got the power? Yeah. And yeah. when you change the power dynamic, man, you're on top. That's just the way it goes. So good. <laughs> so good. And I want to put a pin in that again for our listeners out there. Notice that when Hesha is doing that, she's standing her ground and being able to take that power back, but she's not doing it by being aggressive or offensive. She's doing it by getting curious, asking those questions, making those statements and asserting power in that way. Such a powerful way to show up. I love that. And now you've touched on it a little bit, but I know you're really known for your unique talent to be able to manage those big egos and strong personalities and, you know, get the, the, all of the different personalities types out there and try and manage those egos in negotiations. I'd love if you could tell us a little bit about your secret sauce on that. Oh, uh, well, it, it's again, it depends on the person. So again, I like to use analogies because people live and breathe and think in analogies. So think about blood. Blood transfusions happened in the 1750s. And of course, you know, this one lived, this one died. They tried transforming blood from a lamb into a person. Of course, they died, you know, but they couldn't figure out why and how it worked. It wasn't until the early 1900s that we actually figured out blood types that, oh, you can live from this one and you can die from that one. They really didn't know. Yeah. So we have to do the same thing. Chapter one, the way the number one thing I say is speak into the ears that are hearing you. Yeah. You would speak to an introvert differently than you would speak to an extrovert, yeah. right? I'm hoping most of your listeners know the difference between visual, auditory, and kinesthetic learners. Yeah. Visual learners learn and process data by seeing, auditory by ear, yeah. and kinesthetic by touch. And I'll give you a quick and easy way to figure out exactly what somebody is as you're listening to them talk. Because yeah. the first part is listening, right? You're listening, you're mirroring, you're, you're asking questions, you're curious, blah, blah, all that good stuff. Yeah. But the secret sauce underneath is you're really listening for what are the ears I'm speaking yeah. into? So if somebody says, I hear what you're saying. That sounds good to me. Yeah. They're on story. I'm only going to use auditory words with them. Yeah. If somebody says, that looks good to me. You know, I, I see where you're going with this. Ah, I'm only using visual with them. 
which by the way is 65 ish percent of the population. If it's kinesthetic, they're going to say, I feel it in my gut. Yeah. Or I get what you're saying. Yeah. Or let's walk that back a little. Yeah. They'll use those kind of words. I'm only going to use those words with them. Now, nobody's going to say, oh my God, they, she, she ascertained that I was a kinesthetic learner and <laughs> only use kinesthetic words. No, but yeah. they're just going to say, she gets me. Yeah. Yeah. She gets me. I feel comfortable and safe with her. Yeah. She understands. It's the subtle thing about either you're an iPhone or an Android, Yeah. right? They're both smartphones, but you're going through the correct operating system on how you process data and information. And that's just honestly sort of level one kind of stuff that you play with. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. And what are the different ways that you found that ego shows up in the room? Like when you're managing, oh, new and I, I love that you're talking about that listening for the language, because again, it's so simple, right? That, you know, oh, I see what you're doing you know, versus, yeah, I yeah. hear you. Those subtle differences really speak to it. What are some other ways that ego shows up and how you deal with it? Good. Well, first of all, I make the assumption that it's bumper car ego at all times. I love that. At all times. You just <laughs> have to assume that that's the case because you'll be cruising along and everything's fine. And all of a sudden it gets all cattywampus. Like what yeah. just happened? Well, you ran over an ego bump and didn't see it. Yeah. So back up a little bit, try to figure out what happened so that you can correct it because it will just keep going and getting worse if you keep going. Yeah. So with ego, this is interesting. Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky were economists who won, and psychologists, I think, they won a Nobel Prize in economics by proving the psychology of how people buy and spend and decide. We think that most people are driven to win. That is actually not true. Yeah. About 85 to 90% of people are driven to not lose. Yeah. That's a huge difference, yeah. huge. So if you get a bump in the road with somebody, back up a moment, are they trying to win? Probably, it may look and sound like that, but it's probably not what it is. Yeah. How are they trying not to lose? What is the soft candy center yeah. that they are trying to protect that you inadvertently or allowed someone else inadvertently to prick a scab off and it's yeah. bleeding a little? So you back up and you address that. What What is that? How do we fix it? Do Is there a boundary that needs to be done? Is there a safety? Is there a timing issue? where the person's been given a certain amount of authority and the head boss is out of town and I don't want to look like an idiot yeah. to go ask for more right now. Yeah. Okay. So that's the curiosity piece you were referencing. You lean forward. Yeah. What is it there? And I like to give analogies is that if you drip spaghetti sauce on the counter, you can wipe it up with a sponge right away. It's no problem. If you leave it overnight, yeah. you're scraping off with a spatula. Yeah. If you leave it for a couple of months, it's old and moldy and gross. Yeah. It's the same thing with these little ego things. If yeah. you deal with it right away, yeah. you could wipe it right up. If you leave it, it's harder. Yeah. And if you leave it longer, it is harder still. <laughs> you are the analogy <laughs> queen. I, like I am. <laughs> the human brain thinks in analogies. So I speak so and talk in stories and pictures. And that's why in the book, it's filled with stories. And yeah. what I tell people is take my stories. Like rather than say to somebody, you know, blah, 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 blah. Take this story that makes that point and say to somebody when it's tense, yeah. can I tell you a story or yeah. can I share a story with you? And then tell, take one of my stories, tell it to them. And then realization dawns in their eyes yeah. and they go, oh, and then they get to figure it out themselves. They will resist you less. They yeah. will less. And it's the way our human brain works. Yeah. So good. So good. And what role do you think creativity plays in negotiation? Oh, every, huge. Now see, again, this is interesting. Speak into the ears that are hearing you. What if you're dealing with a CPA regulatory type who does not have a creative bone in their yes. body <laughs> and you're super creative? Yeah. It's not going to land. No matter what you do, you're going to threaten and challenge them. And now you're an Android talking to an iPhone. Like what are you doing to me, right? So you first look into the ears that are hearing you. There are certain people that are really open to creativity. There are many others that are not yeah. at all. So you have to know what you're talking about. And then I use creativity, big C and creativity, small C. Yeah. People who can handle creativity big are a small, much smaller minority, yeah. but they're fun. That's fun when you get to do that stuff, yeah. but they're a much smaller minority. Creativity, a small C. Okay. A lot of people can do that. We can do that. And then some people just look at you like, what are you even saying to me? Like, what is that even about? So why do that? Because all it will do is disrupt the rapport you have with the person. So yeah. you speak into the ears that are hearing you. Yeah. Although even that's a form of creativity, right? I mean, 
being aware enough to say, who am I dealing with here? Okay, this is not somebody who's going to be receptive to really outside the box ideas. That in and of itself takes a certain creativity in approaching the negotiation, right? So you're right. Honestly, yeah. you're right. You're yeah. right. Yeah, I love that. And we were chatting just before we jumped online. I know it's a dangerous subject sometimes, but I'd love you to speak to what role, if any, you think that gender plays in negotiations. Oh, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. You know, when we were talking about that, remember, you know, women only got the right to vote a little more than 100 years ago. And we forget women couldn't get credit cards, you couldn't yeah. inherit money, you couldn't open a bank account. I mean, in Saudi Arabia, just now, finally, they're allowing women to drive. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. It's just insane. And we forget how hard it is. Well, you've got generations and generations of men that have been raised that way, you know, and you've got men that are raised that say women shouldn't wear pants. Yeah. Women should always be in a skirt. Now, as women, we're like, that's just absurd. <laughs> but if it's inculcated into their heads, which it will get better generation after generation as women are out and powerful and strong and people are, are just comfortable with it. But again, that's the speak into the ears that are hearing you. So when I'm doing the bonding, connecting with somebody, you yeah. try to connect with them on personal stuff, kids, where they live, where they vacation, what flavor of ice cream they like, you know, whatever, because you're trying to suss out that, how comfortable they are with you as a woman. Some men are very uncomfortable with aggressive women. Yeah. Some men are very uncomfortable with emotional women. Some are very uncomfortable with shrill women. And they actually will provoke those reactions unconsciously because that's what they expect. Yeah. So if I am holding the calm, I've got control over myself. Yeah. I speak into the ears that are hearing me yeah. and I look and I see what does this person need. And honestly, sometimes I can be more aggressive. Sometimes I could be more nurturing or motherly. Yeah. Now I'm a little older now, so I can kind of pull out the grandmother card. Yeah. <laughs> it, it depends on what I need with somebody. And I'll tell you, I've sometimes had cases where, you know, big fancy guys, when it was done, asked me, did I do okay? Did yeah. I do a good job? And, and when that first happened to me, I was flabbergasted. Like, <laughs> what do you, what? And then I realized they were wanting some of that nurturing energy. And you know what? It doesn't cost me anything to give it to them. So yeah. fine. That's what our generation is now. Our daughters and granddaughters will have an easier time of it, yeah. but we're still plowing the fields and helping people be comfortable. Because yeah. I know there's a dumb conversation about can a woman even be president of the United States? I just think the question is dumb. Yeah. The conversation is dumb. And it just shows how limited it is. And all I can say to those of us, we just don't buy into it. It's yeah. like saying, no, the earth is not flat. The moon landing <laughs> happened. Elvis <laughs> absolutely died. You know, I'm just not going to give it any oxygen. <laughs> So good. And I love that you spoke to that idea about the unconscious word that you use, because so much of these issues around gender are unconscious gender biases and not just held by men, but that we hold ourselves. Like, you know, studies show that we underperform when yes. our gender is raised. You know, I mean, young girls perform more poorly on their SATs when they're asked yes. to identify their gender and advance the writing the test. It's like really mind blowing. Yes. And yet not when you consider, as you say, that it's still recent history that we're we're getting so we have to start redefining, raising our awareness, bringing some of these unconscious gender biases from both yes. genders, frankly, raise them into our awareness because we run the risk of sliding back. As you say, our daughters or our granddaughters won't have those issues, but we've seen recently on the political scene how easy it is to lose ground again yes. and stop recognizing. Yes. So I love that you, you spoke to that. I would, I would, you know, I don't, haven't really said this publicly, but I'm, you know, I'm, I, being vulnerable is a way that you actually can bond and connect with people. And I feel like as a woman now, as a woman leader, I really need to do that. When I was a young girl, it was made very clear to me that I wasn't pretty. And so in my mind, I actually somehow remember being seven or eight and saying, well, better darn well be smart because I'm not pretty. I think you're gorgeous, and by the way. Let me just say that for the record. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I thank you. But then when I became a young teenager, I was told overtly, I mean, my father actually told me, oh, you'll never get married. You'll never get a man because men can't handle smart women. I mean, you will you will challenge their egos and they can't handle it. It was awful. And when I did get married, in part, I think I married the wrong person the first time because it was, you know, a kick in the pants to them. Like, ha ha, see, yeah. somebody does want me. Yeah. But I will tell you, it took me two decades of yeah. therapy to get those tapes out of my head yes. and to say, I and, and my husband now loves having a strong... Yes. Intelligent women. 
I know so many men that love and are desirous of having a yeah. strong, intelligent woman. They want that. So like my chauvinistic, misogynistic father was completely wrong. <laughs> you know, those tapes, but those tapes come in societally. And so what I would say to our women listeners is honestly evaluate what those tapes are in your head and say, do they serve you? Yeah. And if they don't serve you, work on erasing those suckers because yeah. all they're doing is harming you from fully expressing your power and who you are. And, and I'll tell you, I've done a lot of hospital hospice work. I've helped people die. I have never had a woman on a hospital bed express regret for what she did. Yeah. I've had them express regret for what they didn't do. So true. And so I'd say, man, grab life by the horns. It's yours. Yeah. Don't let anyone take it from you. You grab your life and quality people will want to be around you if you do that. Oh, and, and Hesh, I want to thank you truly for sharing so vulnerably. I think it's so important that we start allowing ourselves to be vulnerable. I mean, mental health is on the rise in unprecedented ways. And I think until we start normalizing some of the conversations about these things, things aren't going to change. Yeah. But, and even on the piece of vulnerability, I think approaching negotiations with a little more transparent vulnerability can shift how we show up, get out of that distributive kind of mindset that got to hold all your cards to your chest because that stops people from finding when you're so focused on just your outcome like I want x and you want y and I'm sticking to x there are so often more beautiful opportunities sitting right on the table between them that are better than x or y yes. if you're not yes. open to it you're going to miss it so that vulnerability yes. piece is so gorgeous and as you so eloquently said, be aware of the stories that you're telling yourself, right? And be ready to challenge those flip. If they are not empowering stories, flip them like a 180 degree flip. So thank yeah. you so much for, for sharing that. And you had mentioned emotions earlier about men expecting sort of, oh, I don't like dealing with an emotional woman. What role, if any, do you think emotion plays in negotiations? Well, there's the real emotions and then there's the fake drama of the emotions. Very I good. mean, how many times you have somebody pitch a fit and it's just a tactic? Yes. Right? Right. You got to know. Yeah. And if you're paying attention to the vomit yeah. to see what it is, you'll know if it's fake yeah. and you'll call bluff. Yeah. You're right. So you're paying attention and you know, and there's so much of that fake walking away, yelling, all that kind of stuff. And anything said quietly and resolutely yeah. is more scary yeah. than anything that said big and loud almost is fake, you know? And once you know to look and you know how to find it, it's like, yeah, I don't think so. I'm going to call your bluff on that one. Cause yeah. you can always come back and say, except for the few cases where you can't, in which case that goes into your BATNA and your analysis of, yeah. you know, how you handle it. And I think your listeners know what BATNA is. I'm assuming best alternative yeah. to an negotiated agreement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and feel, but feel free to go. I mean, not everybody we have, you know, people come, come and go and we get new people all the time showing. So by all means, sure. explain Batna for a moment. It's always worth it. So it was first coined by Fisher and Yuri out of the Harvard Negotiation Project. God, 30 something know, years ago. Crazy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and what they call it is it's the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And they call it a Batna. And what that is, is before you go into a negotiation, you say, okay, this is what I want. This is what I think they're going to do. This is what I'm going to do. Okay. This is what I want. Let's say I can't get there and it completely falls apart and they stonewall me and they won't do it. What are my options and my choices? What else do I have? That tells me how tough and how strong I need to be in a negotiation because I have other options and alternatives. And so part of your negotiation prep is to improve your BATNA, to do everything you can to make your other alternatives either really look attractive or fake look attractive to the other side. Because <laughs> if the other side is good, they are examining your BATNA yeah. and you should be examining their BATNA because then you know how badly do we need this? What other options do we have? Yeah. And if you're being curious and you're listening in a negotiation, you may not have known about another BATNA they had and all of a sudden you learn it. Now you have to decide, is it real? Is it subterfuge? Is it a bluff? Yeah. Now you're having to analyze that. And that's why this speaking into the ears that are hearing you thing yeah. and paying attention is so important. And using these sentence stems and some of these tools is so important so that you don't get played, yeah. so that you know what it is you're doing. Because there's a time when you can say, I'm going to be vulnerable and share. Well, that's not good if you get taken advantage of, Yeah. right? So yeah. if you're going to do that, you have to decide it's a safe place yeah. that you want to do it because it's going to achieve a particular result for you. And then other times someone's not safe or they'll use it against you. And you're speaking into the years, you're not talking about the benefits of a plant-based diet to a lion. You know, you just, you just don't, why would you do that? You know, 
<laughs> you, you talk about there's antelopes over there that are much yeah. more juicy than me. Go get them. <laughs> and that fact, I'm actually glad you did dig a little deeper on that because I think it's so important to to remind our listeners there as well that because I over the years and I'm sure you have as well, I've seen people walk away from a deal that made sense for them because they hadn't explored their mountain and didn't realize there wasn't a better alternative to what they had on the table. And the opposite is also true. When people had a great batna, but hadn't really done their homework, their preparation to know what their batna was, and they kept bargaining way past the point when it made sense for them anymore, when they had a better batna sitting right there. So, correct. yeah. Well, there's, I actually have a chapter in the book called The Dangers of Over-Negotiating. And I was in Thailand and I hear this, and some, I mean, North, rural, 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 at this little, you know, nothing market. And this American woman is arguing with this little Thai woman and ferociously arguing, like ferociously. And I just watched, I just thought it was fascinating. Yeah. And she wouldn't disengage. And this poor little Thai woman couldn't disengage either. It was crazy. And I just, I couldn't help myself. I walked up to her. I whispered in her ear. I said, it's a dollar. She lives in a hut. <laughs> And it broke the woman's trance. And then they were able to conclude whatever it was. And that in negotiation, sometimes people get that carnivorous bloodlust. I want to win. Ah! And it's not really winning anything. It's the going for the last dollar and the last penny. And it's not effective. Yeah. It doesn't leave people with what I call a wowed, a yeah. way out with dignity. It yeah. doesn't leave them with their sword. Like Ulysses F. Grant allowed the Confederate general, you know, Robert E. Lee. And that's why the Civil War ended. I mean, there's a lot of those stories we tell about there's a benefit and you can say, well, I'm never going to see them again. Yeah. You know what? Six degrees of separation, my friends, life has a way of turning yeah. around and people hold on to those nasty little resentments yeah. and store them like nuts for a winter. Yeah. And you never know when that's going to come back and bite you on yeah. the rear end. So why not cauterize a wound? Why not make it clean and yeah. good? And all it does is really improve your own skill set anyway. Yeah. And then you just get known as a person people want to deal with and that they can handle and do it. And it's yeah. it actually makes it more fun and less scary. Yeah. I like that WOWD acronym, actually. Like, I mean, I talk about the idea about letting people walk away, but I like actually the acronym makes it easy to remember. Let them walk away with dignity. It's such an important element, right? WOWD. So. It's a WOWD. A way out with dignity. Yeah. So beautiful. And what would you say are the key reasons that you've seen that negotiations fail in your experience because people don't do any of the things we've talked about <laughs> they, they come in with a preconceived idea and they say oh, this is how we're going to do it yeah. you know and they don't allow for the bumper car egos there's a whole chapter in the book i talk about this about there's actually federal labor laws that and this might i don't know if we have time for like a quick story do we have time sure. for a quick story yeah yeah so there was this guy who was the head of ge negotiating and GE had lots of labor problems, lots yeah. of it. And he was an engineer, of course. And he thought, well, I'm just going to short circuit all this touchy, feely, interpersonal, emotional crap. I'm going to get rid of all that junk. And I'm just going to look at the facts. I'm going to analyze them. I'm going to use the data. Yeah. I'm going to present the data and say, here's the deal. Take it or leave it. Well, that failed yeah. completely right? <laughs> and totally. And so the question then is, let's say he was even right. Logically, he was right. He didn't deal with the amygdala that no one wants to be on the receiving end of, hey, look, I'm smarter than you. I'm better than you. Yeah. I analyze research better than you. I'm just going to tell you how it is. And you're going to say, okay, yeah. Let me know how that works out for you. <laughs> <It doesn't>. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> and I know we've talked about a bunch of them probably indirectly, but if you were going to summarize what you think are the key skills or the hallmarks, if you will, of a great negotiator, what would be your top ones? Speak into the ears that are hearing you, leaning in and being curious into the vomit, yeah. <laughs> identifying whether somebody is introvert, extrovert, or visual, yeah. auditory, kinesthetic, and speaking their language. Yes. analyzing your BATNA and the other person's BATNA and be willing to be wrong and yeah. change what you think the BATNA is based on learning yeah. and what happened. Yeah. That's probably the most important thing. The other thing that I do, I have a whole thing in the book. I talk about plural pronouns because what tends to happen is we say, I want this, you want that. Well, tribalism is a very important part of our brain and part, and part of our amygdala. And we can create an us versus them game in an hour yeah. by just giving people assignments and 
laboratories and all of a sudden they hate the blue shirts opposed to the red shirts. Yeah. It's just wired into our brain. So whenever I'm talking with people, I always use we pronouns. Yes. How are we going to handle this? How are we going to do this? And it just, sometimes people look at you kind of weird because, you know, there's no we here. What are you talking about? But it it deflects from the tribal, I, you know, Hatfield and McCoys and you versus me into yeah. we have a problem. Let's put the problem in the center of the table and yeah. let's engage in some problem solving and potential team building. Yeah. And for some people, you can do it overtly because they're open to that. But 95% you can't, yeah. but you do it anyway. You don't have to tell them why you're doing it. Yeah. You just all of a sudden take control the ball and say, this is how we're going to do it because yeah. we are going to do this. And then you give up little things to the other side. People think it, it's an old style of negotiating that I do not think is effective at all, where I want to control everything. You are going to come to my office. You're going to yeah. eat lunch my yes. way. We're going to do yes. my agenda. It honestly, Fire. it works with like you know, abused women yeah. and people, you know, people who can't fight back, but yeah. what is the point of that? Yeah. So it's so much better to give unimportant things because yeah. there's a neuroscience bias of reciprocity wired into our yeah. brain. You yeah. do something for me. I feel like a weird inclination to kind of reciprocate to you. So <laughs> wherever you want to hold this, okay, what time do you want to start? Yeah. Is the temperature good in here? What would you like to break for lunch? Oh. When should we do that? You give up little unimportant things, or even let's say something important that you don't really care about. You give it up early. They will be shocked. Then your next move is you're tough because yeah. they can't get yeah. you weak. Yeah. So your next move is tough. Well, now you've completely confused them. And their little meeting that they had where they looked at your BATNA now gets thrown out the window because yeah. now they don't know what the heck is going on. So who's got control of that meeting? Yeah. You do. <laughs> <laughs> so good. And that we is so important. Like I, I think, and it, it works on both levels, right? Because even unconsciously it triggers when you're using that language where it's us together, right? When we're working on this, you know, as a team approach. And, and it reminded me as you were saying that, and I hadn't thought of it in those terms. I always say, oh, this was sort of the inkling of my for art of feminine negotiation, but it actually centered around that we, because in law school, I did a negotiation course and you ended up basically negotiating for your marks because you were put, you know, broke off and whoever got the best settlement got the best mark and everybody else got slotted all the way down. So it was really competitive. But my approach back then just intuitively was always, okay, we've only got 50 minutes. You know, if we don't get a deal, we're going to get a zero. So what can we do here? What do you need? Tell me it was this very cooperative. It's you and I against the system. It's you and I against beating this approach and had a great success, right? One almost every, virtually every negotiation that year. Then I started Bingo. the practice of law and it was like, oh, that can't be the right approach. I need to, you know, take no prisoners when I come. A very different mindset. And it took me a lot of years to get back to that more authentic version of that we approach, right? So Bingo. it honestly works. And the trick is you don't do it just like you don't eat a diet of only candy. Yes. You need some broccoli and salad with your candy. So if you do something that's an unexpected give, yes. because you want to get things moving, your next one is very tough. Now they don't know how to predict you. Yeah. What does that mean? Say, look, I'm where I can be. Look at, I told you I was going to be credible and I was going to be pragmatic and where I can give to you, I will give to you. Yeah. But there's certain things that I, where I just can't. Yeah. Now, when you say that you have credibility, yeah. it doesn't sound like bluffing. They listen to you and they're not going to push you as much to test it. Yeah. That reciprocity piece so important as well. Right. Uh, you know, one of the things I often talk about is I call it elevated active listening. And I really, I thought of that as you were saying about reciprocity, that one, because we tend, we're so conditioned that when somebody takes a position that is contrary to what we believe in or contrary to the position we're going to take, we immediately want to fight against it, right? And I always say, look, when you're going to be reflecting back to somebody what they've said, wherever possible, be as gracious, present their argument back to them in even yes. more eloquent terms than they did. Yes. And it totally Beautiful. throws them off balance. And Beautiful. the vast majority of cases, they're going to reciprocate, right? And Beautiful. show up differently for you. for you. Yeah. No, I um, love I would add a corollary. That is absolutely beautiful. And what I want to do for your listeners is that is great. And then I always want to say, let's do the advanced, right? Let's say someone is hateful. Yes. They are just, you can't do that to them. They're just hateful. They're horrible. Yeah. You know, you think they're racist or homophobic or they're, they're whatever you, you know, whatever you don't like or want, that it's that bad. And you're kind of stuck dealing with this person. Well, if you keep thinking about them that way, First of all, it will be miserable and yeah. you won't be successful and it will eat away at you. Your blood pressure will go up, it will harm your health. So what I sell people is look at that person 
and say, would they pull my kid out of a burning car? 98% of the time, the answer is yes, because you're not going to be dealing with sociopaths. Yeah. And if you are, then okay, you have to deal with different techniques. But 98% of they're yes. So do I have to wait until they pull my kid out of a burning car? Or can I see that potential of goodness in them and speak to that? Yeah. Now they'll fight me less mm -hmm. because you don't know everybody is going through pain. Yes. Everybody's got some, some yeah. a heck of a lot more than others. Yeah. And we hide it really well. I mean, supposedly a third of all Americans are on antidepressants. Yeah. We self-medicate with alcohol and marijuana, shopping, sex. So there's a huge high misery yeah. factor out there. You have no idea what this other person is dealing with. They may have, you know, I remember once I pinched my shoulder and it wouldn't go away for like three months. And on that last month, I was cranky pants <laughs> and I didn't like it. And I kept trying to not be, but I was in pain all the time. You have no idea. So if you approach it like that, yeah. again, who's got the power in that interaction? Yeah. You, so, you. So beautiful. That's like that Amanda Marshall song, you know, that taxi driver's got a PhD or whatever the lyrics are that you never know what somebody else's experience is. That's beautiful. I love that advice. So gorgeous. Well, Hesha, this has been absolutely fantastic. I, I've got to get you back because this, I just love, love, love this conversation. I can't believe how fast our time together is gone. <laughs> and I usually like to end by asking, what's one of the greatest mindset shifts you've ever had in your life? And it doesn't have to be about negotiations. It doesn't have to be this issue. It can be anything where you had that shift in how you approach the world. That I could be in power, mm -hmm. that I could create and shift my reality, that the glass was going to be half full and not half empty. That was my choice. Nice. Oh, that's powerful. This has been gorgeous. So thank you so much for joining us, Hesha. I've loved every minute pleasure. of the conversation. So <laughs> thank you. My pleasure. And for everybody out there, make sure as well, we'll put this in the show notes too, but make sure to check out Hesha's book. It is Holding the Calm. You can find that at www.holdingthecalm.com. Make sure to check that out. And where else would you like them to, uh, where can they learn more about you, Hesha? Yeah, and then they can, the book's on Amazon and Target and Barnes and Noble and everywhere. But if they go to my website, I'm still trying to, I'm I'm just trying to get this message out there and help people. So yeah. I've created little one minute holding the calm tips and videos. Nice. And if they go to the website and sign up every month, I'm going to send out one or two of them as I think of it. And as I have time to record them, it's just, you know, an extra little thing you can do right now. That's one minute. It's easy to be able to do. So hopefully that would be helpful to them. That's awesome. That's beautiful. Well, I am sure you have all just got incredible value from this episode. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't. Make sure to give it a, a rating as well. Share this episode with everybody. There were so many incredible, beautiful gems and easy to remember analogies that you're going to be able to keep in your pocket and remember when you're in facing a difficult conversation in life. So make sure to share, share, share this message. And just before we sign off today, just wanted to share, speaking of sharing, some ways that we could work together if you're looking to up level your negotiation skills. I've got everything from online to group to my signature one-on-one -on -one mastermind or VIP experiences. So you can help leverage your innate powers to get more of what you want and deserve in life. If that sounds interesting, check out our website at artoffemininenegotiation.com. And that is a wrap for this episode. We're going to make sure to put the contact information for Hesha in our show notes. But until next time, I invite you to go forth and negotiate your best life on your terms. So you can stop missing out and start getting more of what you want and deserve from the boardroom to the bedroom. Until next time, take care.